We lived in Chicago for a few years when the Lord called us into ministry. And we changed our careers and we went to study there. When we were there, we noticed there was a man called Louis, Louis Clark. And he used to wander around and there were always young men following him. And I thought, this is a bit strange. What's he doing? And he would sit with them and he would have coffee with them and he would speak and he would listen. And we were immediately suspicious because we come from Scotland and everything. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so we were thinking, what, what, what's he doing? What, what is he doing? And then we heard he used to be a pastor, but then as he preached and preached, he didn't see that there was discipleship happening in the people, that they weren't learning to follow well. So he gave up that and he started just meeting with people over meals, around places, and seeing growth. All over the place seeing growth. And then Louis asked whether he could meet with us. And uh, we said, okay. And uh, so we met with him and he asked hard questions. He wasn't just accepting how shiny we looked on the outside at all. He was a disciple maker. <laughs> he asked hard questions. He asked about purpose, about vision, about idols. It was uncomfortable. Last week, I had an appraisal um, I, was, I met with the pastor in our church because I worked for the church a couple of days a week. And um, the appraisal was by this uh, man in his early 30s and he was speaking to me and asking me how I was doing and what was happening in the church and what was I seeing. And he asked hard questions as well. He's in his 30s, I'm not. Um, and he, he was a, he's a disciple maker because he is willing to take risks and that is what you are. You're willing to take risks in relationships which are not just accepting everything at face value, but it's going deeper, asking more, stepping into places which aren't shown, asking questions about hidden things because, because we have a vision of a greater future for the person in front of us, haven't we? We can see a little bit more because we want God to be, be able to have full authority in their lives. That's what we want. And so because of that, we do go into those deep places. And because of that, we do ask the hard questions. And we're willing to tread into places of fear where there's no map <laughs> to exegete the soul, to find out what is in the heart. These kind of conversations go against culture, the culture of just fitting in and presenting your best self. And why? Because we see more. Because we know that a surrendered life before Christ is a far stronger life than one that is fighting with everything that he lets into our lives. We can fight or we can ask, okay, Lord, here we are. What is it you would like to teach me today? And we see that for them. And we take them to deeper places because of that. Now, as we read books about discipleship, there are great big calls to us, which have us uh, cowering <laughs> sometimes. I had a little notice in my office when I was in one Bible college in Edinburgh, in Scotland. And it, the little notice was a quotation from Winston Churchill the prime minister in uh, uh, long ago. And it says, it said, we teach what we know, we reproduce what we are. And that stood as a slap across my head every time I walked into my door. Um, we teach what we know, we reproduce who we are, who we are. Or Kevin DeYoung, who has spoken about discipleship extensively, and says the one indispensable requirement for producing godly, mature Christians is godly, mature Christians. It's not just what we're producing, it's who we are, isn't it? And these quotes and these calls to mobilize us in our disciple making, these are, they're wonderful, but they sometimes make us think, well, maybe on a good day, 
<laughs> we could come close, but, oh, Lord, this is too much. But then we forget that we're disciples too. We're, we're disciples of the great king. And if we are Jesus' disciple, that means we're with him. We're with him in all of our conversations. We're with him to learn from him, to be like him, and we can settle. I asked my friend to take a picture of her little girl's feet in big sandals, <laughs> thinking that is, that is it. We're called to follow Jesus. And we're small, we're little dust creatures, as Eugene Peterson says, but we are called to follow, to come close. I'd like us to think about a, a person in scripture as we think through uh, our discipleship and our disciple making, okay? This person, uh, from the very beginning, found it difficult to belong. He was a disruption in his community. He was trouble in his family. He lived in, in, in the slums, really, um, with slaves outside Ramses. There we are. Outside Ramses. And he was, he was a problem. But there, when he was... Out, it, when he was living with the slaves, Moses learned that there was more to his life, far more. He had a heritage. And under a hundred, uh, well, maybe a thousand starry nights, as Amram, his dad, came in and had his wounds from the lashings of the whip, had them bound again, he would hear stories around campfires of Jehovah. He would hear stories of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. He would hear stories of miracles and of beauty and of the intervention of the king of heaven. He would hear. He would hear stories that there was a deliverer one day coming, a Messiah. One day there would be no more whips. One day there'd be no more working for another man's dreams. One day. He was part of something bigger. Moses was part of something bigger, and he learned that when he was just a child. These people were his people. This is where he belonged. This is it. And then he stepped from poverty to the palace. And he moved into this place of enormous privilege, and he learned how to be strong, how to be a leader. He learned how to be somebody, how to count. That's what he learned. He learned about strategy and war. He learned how to be doing things that are useful. He learned about language and culture. I don't know when that was when he picked up his pen and started writing, because Moses was a writer, wasn't he? We know this. <laughs> There's a lot that he wrote, um, both in the, first, in the Pentateuch and, and there in the Psalms. But all these skills were stirring together with those campfire stories. And, and they were blending in, and it seemed that everything was lining up. He could see it all. You know, his heart was pumping, his vision was on fire. This was the time. He was ready for such a time as this. I borrowed from Esther. But he was ready to go and do great things for God and to go and, and be somebody. Do you remember when you came out of, maybe it was Bible college or university, or maybe you completed the apprenticeship or you aced the re residency and you came out thinking, I can make a difference. I, I, know, I, know, what, I, I know what to do. I know now, now God can use me. Now, now I'm ready. Now this makes sense. I wonder whether that was how Moses felt. Now, Lord, I've got all of these skills and I know my heritage. Now, now is the time. And he had connections, and he had these skills and authority. Um, this was going to be amazing. And he tried on this new identity, like putting on a coat. And, and at the back, it said, deliverer. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it said on the label. And here is what happened. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their labor. Exodus 2, 11, yeah. 
He watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you a, a ruler and a judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have been made known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. Ah, oh, Lord, I thought I was ready, but that coat of deliverer did not, did not fit. And Moses was trying to find his place and in a world of fame and fortune and privilege. And in his first step, this shininess of new skills and so on, it trumped it trumped the invisible promise of God that he would deliver. And Moses opted for strength and power over prayer. He opted for muscle over trust. Oh, that speaks to my soul. <laughs> I've discipled many, many young people over, over the years, and sometimes we just want to say something. We see a problem, just say something, make uh, tell them to do something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, and, and you give them instruction and you give them something to do and something to go and read. Did I pray for them beforehand? Oh, Lord, this is your disciples, not my disciple. This is your disciple. That's the primary thing. And I didn't even get in touch with you about your disciple. And we, we, we can trust in in various programs and one, two, three, this will be great and shiny and, and this will work. Rather than going to the fount of all knowledge, to the one who has seen that, dis that young one open their eyes and has walked with them through all their days and has seen every single choice, every single thing that they have done. Surely we would communicate with him before. But sometimes, sometimes we choose muscle over trust. But there's another voice, there's another voice, isn't there, in this book that shows us to be still before him in our lives of busyness and full diaries, full calendars, lives of purpose. And it says, be still before me. Learn that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Sit before me and learn of me. And then I will give you insights and wisdom to be able to share with this young person or older person. My pastor was discipling me the other day. Yeah, yeah. Then he will give us wisdom. So when we go from muscle over relationship and just giving instruction over waiting on God, the difficulty is that our disciple learns to do the same, don't they? They learn, I just need to get this, this, this set up in a nice, neat, tidy box and, sh and show all the steps. The steps are great. There are lots and lots of wonderful, wonderful discipleship materials out there. But discipleship is life on life, isn't it? It's follow me as I follow Christ. There's the, there's the nub of it. Moses was misunderstood. He was misunderstood in his steps to belong. He thought he found a way to connect. He thought he found, he found a pathway in. And now, now he couldn't go home to the palace and he couldn't go home to, to uh, the slave quarter. He, he was outside. He was an outsider standing on the edge of his community because he was seen as a threat to their way of life. He wasn't predictable. He wasn't safe. Because he, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't predictable, he wasn't, and, and yeah, sometimes we can be misunderstood as disciple makers as well, can't we? we? We truly can. Just like I misunderstood Louis Clark way back in Chicago and thought, what are you doing? You know, why aren't you behind a pulpit telling us what to do? Why, why are you in this relational dynamic? Well, what's going on here? Surely you need the authority of the pulpit and the, all of these things. 
But that man was in touch with God, praying about these people he was meeting with. And the Lord was changing people and transforming them. Disciples can't be mass produced. We can't drop people into a program and see disciples emerge at the end of it, says Greg Ogden. It takes time to make disciples. It takes individual personal attention. It's not about information transfer from head to head, but it's about imitation from life to life. And as we trust in God, as we walk with him ourselves, then great transformation can happen. So Moses was misunderstood. He thought he was going somewhere. He thought he was made for this. Uh, I've been in the same situation, thought, oh, I've got the answers here. Uh, this is great. As just six years ago, I thought I was going to be in a ministry that was going to just last till I was retired. And then everything changed. And the ministry crumbled. And maybe that's happened for you. And then the Maybe the partnership has fallen apart and the thing that we thought would work, the thing we were sure of, is gone. And it's like sand going through our fingers. And we let people down and it feels like our feet have been set in concrete and we've been put in the Baltic Sea in the middle of February. And we can't breathe because we thought what we were doing was going to work. And there it lies in, in bits. The danger there is that we may start to believe that if we don't fit in with these people, if we don't belong here and they're God's people, then perhaps there's no space for us in the heart of God. Perhaps he's walking out, walked out the door as well. Perhaps... Perhaps there's no space for us and we should just go and get a job at Starbucks and start again. And we withdraw, as Moses withdrew, either running or just cowering and walking away. And so we try on more conventional identities, but they sit like scratchy suits on us. We try and belong and find our place, but after failure, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to trust. Benner says we try on identities like clothing, looking for a style of being that fits with how we want to be seen. His first suit was in the palace. His second one was a scratchy robe in the middle of a desert, a shepherd's cloak. Moses' next identity was filled with years of silence and vulnerable wonderings and looking out into the heavens, knowing that Jehovah was there, knowing he had a heritage, remembering the stories of Abraham, but being far away from what he thought his purpose was, shattered and broken and a failure. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 10 take on the next section of this, um, this incredible story. So 3 verses 1 to 10 says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look on God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in e Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, 
the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing him. And you can almost imagine Moses saying, this is in interesting, Lord. That's great information. I see that you see them, that you hear them, you've got a plan to rescue them. That sounds great. The next verse floored him. Verse 10, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I am sending you. But Lord, <laughs> who am I? Who, who am I? 40 years ago, 40 years ago, Lord, I had power. I had knowledge. I had authority. I had connections. And now I, I am a nobody. Didn't you see me fail? Didn't you see me fail? I have no ability. I have no message. I have no authority. I have no eloquence. And I, I have no inclination. <laughs> I don't want to. I'm done with me. Aren't you done with me? But God did not need a hero to stand tall over his people. He doesn't need a hero. He didn't need a hero to stand tall. He needed a humble servant who would lift others up and who would lead his people to the source of all hope. He wasn't the hope. He wasn't the deliverer. God was the deliverer. And he was wanting to Moses as a humble servant to lead his people to him, the source of peace and hope and goodness. It's not learned in a list of to-dos and five steps to this and ten steps to that and hacks to growth and trying to, you know, bypass things. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Long obedience, as Eugene Peterson says. Um, Erwin McManus says that the history of God's people is not a record of God searching for courageous men and women who could handle the task, but God transforming the hearts of cowards and calling them to live courageous lives. And I sometimes feel like a coward in all of this, don't you? I think, oh God, this is too big for me. I texted that to my husband two days ago, I said, I, I'm not enough. I know I'm not enough. This is too big. And he's like, yes, but the card that I left in your bag says that the Lord is the sufficient one. He is the one and he is the one. And we come to him again and again in the morning by morning as we see his faithfulness. And we stand before him and say, Lord, we are not enough for this task. We are not, but you are the source of hope. So we need to go and move and have our orientation of our hearts and our lives towards you. We are made for him. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. He is the center point. He is the, 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 the one who has decided how you have been made. He is the one who has shown you, who, who has formed you on purpose to be like you are. Not to try and be some wonderful disciple maker that you see across your church pew. <laughs> Not to be like somebody else, but to be who you have been formed before the sight and the gaze of God. I went down to reception earlier and I asked for a flower. They gave me this one. It's alive. It's, it's a real one. Look at this. Look at how it's been made. Now, is this flower worried about how it is and that it's got a white one in the middle of all these pink ones? It's not worried. It's perfectly happy. It shows the splendor and beauty of God. Solomon, robed in all his finery, in Matthew 6 it says, um, is not arrayed like one of these. It's not tempted by false ways of being. <laughs> it's not concerned about what it will be or how it will look. It is at peace to display God's glory. It is at peace. <laughs> and, and you and I can be at peace with the way in which God has made us, the passions that he has placed on our hearts, the calls that he has made in our ears as we've read, well, has, has spoken to us through his word, 
The things that we thought, oh no, I, I need to be more conventional. I need to fit in in this way. God has made us as he has made us, on purpose, with intention to display his glory. So, so Moses, he was saying, well, who am I, Lord? I don't even know who I am anymore. And God says, I've chosen you and I've seen you and you are going to lead my people to the mountain of God. That is what I've put in you, Moses. That is it. And then in, oh, in Exodus chapter 3, as Moses continues in this dialogue with God, in verse 11 to 13, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. This will be the sign to you that, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers have sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? Moses is saying, Lord, not only do I not know who I am, I don't even know what who you are. I don't even know your name. Aren't you the one who's fed up with me? Aren't you the one who is sick of my rash, my rash choices and my foolishness? Isn't that who you are? I have a question for you that I'd like you to answer. Um, if, you, if you have a piece of paper or phone or whatever, I like, I, or, or in your mind, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question is this. What do you think that God thinks when he thinks about you? Not about Christ, about you. What do you think God thinks when he thinks about you? If on your sheet of paper you have written, I think he is disappointed with me, that will have an enormous impact on your relationship with him. Because if I thought that Emmanuel was disappointed with me, would I go close? Would I seek him out? If he went in a lift, I would wait for the next one to come if I thought he was disappointed with me. It has a massive impact on our relationship and on our desire to come close. If you thought he's shaking his head, he wrote, he's shaking his head, Look, all that learning, and what is she doing now? If you think that he is angry and saying, I taught him this before, what's he doing? That will have an enormous bearing on whether we come close. A huge bearing. Ryan says, <coughs> the private images that we hold of God have a powerful effect on our behavior, massive effect on our behavior. They determine whether we are gonna tell everybody all the things in our calendars, <laughs> or whether we need to make sure that we are showing everybody that we're doing lots of things. That would be a God who might be disappointed in us, if that's what is in our minds. They have a powerful effect on our behavior they profoundly impact our spiritual well-being, and they're, they're related to images of ourselves. What we're doing is we're saying, I am disappointed in me. I am fed up. My prayer life, I am frustrated with my Bible reading, so therefore God must be a larger version of me, and he must be thinking exactly the same. But God is not a larger version of us. He is not. He is more. He is greater. He is far beyond our imaginings. He is not taken up. <laughs> He's not just a projection of our thoughts. He is far greater, isn't he? He is far more. Um, A.W. Tozer said this magnificent thing. He said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about your life. And what has just come into our minds when we thought about God, that's the most important thing because that determines our relationship 
which we will then multiply into the relationships of our disciples and their God. Because they, ref they, they follow, don't many disciples follow? That, that's the nature of being a disciple of God. I, I drew this when I, well, I worshipped a God who was a very angry God for a very long time. Uh, very angry. I was angry with myself, so therefore I, I assumed that God was angry with me. My parents were very loud, shouty preachers. <laughs> and I trembled in the, in the pew and I saw people coming and, and crying before. And I thought God must be very angry. He must be very cross. And I thought that when I was a child and as I grew up and as a teenager. And this was in my, my 30s, I drew this. No, no, late 20s, I drew this. And... And through the kindness of my wonderful husband and through the, the amazing truths in the Bible, I discovered that the God I worship wasn't there. I needed to turn around <laughs> and see that the God who was to be worshipped is majestic and powerful and strong and mighty. And he comes close to us and he reaches out to us. And he carves our names on his hand. And he says that we are his. It, it, so that is a long ago drawing. I don't even know where it is anymore. It's only on digital now because it, it, was, it doesn't mean anything anymore to me because that is not God. <laughs> that, that is not who he is. What, what I'd like to do just for a minute is um, I, I would like to invite us into a small uh, exercise. So. Uh, first of all, a story. Uh, Peter was seven, and it was Father's Day on Sunday. And he thought, I will do something very special for my dad. And what I'll do is I'll go and make him breakfast. So he goes downstairs, and he gets his father's plate, a favorite plate, and he puts the toast on the plate. Seven, seven. And then he gets a mug, and he fills it with milk because he couldn't reach the kettle, thankfully. <laughs> he gets a mug and he fills it with milk. And just at that point, uh, when it was already on the tray, he heard his dad coming down the stairs and coming into the kitchen. And he took fright. And he, 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 he dropped the tray and, and the, the mug went crashing to the ground. Okay? So some art. So <laughs> Some more art. So, so, so here's the mug, and it has gone crashing to the ground, and the milk is everywhere. Now, what I'd like you to think of is when you see a parent in a supermarket or somewhere, and they have um, they have seen something happen and something has crashed down to the ground, there's maybe jam or something has fallen off the shelf. How do the parents that you see react? How do they react? What do they, what do, they do? Shout. shout. Okay, so they shout. Something else. They blame one each other. They blame? One each other. They want to blame each other. Okay, so they blame, they shout. What else? Okay. Yes. Yes. Angry at the child. Any other, anything else? Life can hear him. You know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Aye, <laughs> amen. You rescue us. <laughs> what? Healing them and saying, okay, fine. And then we'll tell them we can we can do this together. Yes. Kneel down. They are kind. Oops, sorry, that was done the wrong way. Kindness. What what else? Three more. Starts cleaning up. Cleaning. Hide. Yes. 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 And they will hide. <laughs> Take the child and run. <laughs> yes. 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 So give. So instructions. Yeah. One more. Pay for it. Hey? Pay, for it. Pay for it. Yes. <laughs> Pay for it. So, 
Yes. No. Oh, oh, terrible. Lick it up. <laughs> <laughs> so we have all sorts of different reactions to the same thing that has happened. Yes? Same thing. It has happened. And then one parent is furious, one is shouting, one is silent and just... One, one is helping, one is looking after, all of these different reactions. The father will do whatever the father will do independent of the child. It depends on the character of the father. Doesn't it? Depends on the character of the father. So for us, the father will do whatever the father will do. <laughs> Depending on the character of the father, it doesn't matter whether the child has dropped the mug or has broken the window or has burned down the whole house. <laughs> The father will do what the father will do depending on his character, not on the actions of the child. So we need to know who God is. We need to know who he is in order that, <laughs> that we're safe, you know, and that we, we are not thinking, well, one day he'll do this, another day he'll do that. He's not like us. He is altogether different. He is altogether different. This is a, a face. And there's another face. Do you see the face? And it says, as to me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awaken your likeness. There is this peace and beauty in meeting God with us knowing who we are and with knowing who he is. There's this beauty and satisfaction and contentment there in that place where those two meet. That's from Psalm 17. Um, I did that just, the other, just uh, the other day. But this is Augustine. He says, there's no deep knowing of God without a deep knowing of self. And there's no deep knowing of self without a deep knowing of God. We need to know both. You remember Peter. I will stand for you. All else will run away. I'll be the one. That's the things that he proclaimed. And then at the end, when he realized who he was, and he saw the darkness and the depths of his pride, depths of his, uh, his assumptions and the heights of his pride, then he stands before Jesus at the end and says, he says, Simon, do you love me, Lord? <laughs> he said, Jesus, said, Jesus says, Simon, do you agape me, the strong love? And Peter answers, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. I am your friend. He knew who he was. And the next question was, Simon, do you agape me? This deep commitment of, you know, all in love. Simon Peter says, Lord, I phileo you. And then what does Jesus do? <laughs> he does one of the most beautiful things in scripture. He comes down and meets Peter where he is. And he said, Peter, do you phileo me? <laughs> he meets him there. And then Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that that's as far as I can go right now. Because I see who I am. I know who I am. And here I meet you. Here I meet you. And Jesus moves towards Peter. Isn't that beautiful? He moves towards him and lifts him up and commissions him to, to lead the church. <laughs> as Peter knows himself and as he knows his God. Yeah. Anyway, that was unintended, but, but beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Calvin. He says, nearly all the wisdom we possess consists of two parts, the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of ourselves. That is what we need. And as disciple makers, we need to know who we are. Our propensity to worry, our propensity to fill our calendars too much, all, all the different things that we choose. We need to know that about ourselves and understand that we meet God like that. And then rather than hiding it, you know, we come to him as we are. So we have looked at God. We have looked at us. We have looked at Moses. 
his wrestle, his need to know who he is and who God is. How did things work out? <laughs> now, we know, but in, in, ver in chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2, Moses says, what if they don't believe me? So I'm going to these Israelites. What if they don't believe me? They didn't believe me last time. <laughs> what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord did not appear to you. And self-doubt chokes Moses. He thinks, God, what if, what if they reject me? What if they want nothing to do with me? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? And Moses said, it's a staff. It's just my staff. It's just the ordinary thing that I use to do my work. That's all it is. There's nothing special about this. I mean, I wonder whether he was thinking, Lord, we were talking about really big things right there. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what we're talking about when you're talking about a shepherd's staff. What, what is that in your hand? And the Lord said to him, throw it down. Lord, it's just an ordinary, normal thing. What would you want with this? There's a wonderful lady in the church that I used to belong to called Sue. We were talking about discipleship. Sue's in her 70s and has, has been pouring into the lives of young people for decades. And she said, discipleship? No, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to do discipleship. And I looked at her and thought, you, you don't know? How? She said, oh, no. Well, I said, Sue, tell us what you do. Oh, um, I bake. And uh, I always have students come and help me as I bake. And as we bake, uh, as we do the rolling pin, and as we, we talk about what's happening in their lives and about what God has to say about things. And uh, it's just a rolling pin, Heather. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just bread. And I was like, that thing in your hands is, <laughs> is being used by the creator to bring people closer to him. That's what's happening right there. And, and you might say, well, what is in my hand? It, my, my, in my hand is a coffee cup as I meet with these young people. <laughs> that this is what's in my hand. I, I mean, it's nothing special. We all drink it, coffee every day. And, and the Lord's like, okay, just lay it down. Lay it down. Or may, maybe, this is from the Art, Artist Network, you see, it's paintbrush. So <laughs> maybe I'm working with young people and it's paint and glue. Lord, this is nothing special. You get it at any store. This is nothing special. It's just the things that I do. And I say, okay, that in your hand, lay it down. Lay it down before me. Lay it down. Surrender it to God and let him decide on its role. Let him, let him decide. And what did God transform it into? He transformed it into a serpent into a snake. A snake? Lord, why did you choose a snake? What? Surely there was better things to choose than a snake. You've studied the Egyptians when you were in school. What is on the front of every Egyptian pharaoh as the symbol of divine authority for him to do what he is doing? A snake? So God took that thing in his hand, that ordinary thing, and in Moses' mind, as soon as you look at a snake, he has seen it in the palace again and again as the pharaoh walked around the palace. That was, <laughs> that was the sign of divine authority that the, that the pharaoh could, could, could rule and could govern and could lead. And God changed it into that. And you know then what Moses says a little bit later? It says in 4 verse 20, it says, so Moses took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hands. He took the staff of God. So, the staff of God. <laughs> he took the ordinary things that you do as we surrender and lay them down before the king of all kings. 
He took those ordinary, normal things as we give them over to God and say, Lord, these are your gifts, your graces. I am in your employment here, and this is for your glory. This is your disciple. Make me wise, show me, direct me by your Holy Spirit. This is a sacred moment with this person. And Lord, I pray that you would use these ordinary things, these ordinary normal things, whatever they may be, and use them for your glory. That one day as we stand before that throne and see our Jesus face to face and worship him, we'll look down the line and we'll see that the people that we met for coffee have been living their lives to the full for Jesus. Now I know that there's all sorts of dips and valleys and all of the rest, but as we give our gifts to Jesus, as we give the things that he, he has made and he has given us, he does something extraordinary and uses the ordinary things in our hands to do something transcendent in the lives of people. And then what does he say? Well, beforehand, what did he say? He said, Moses, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. I just think that when we meet our disciples, the people that we're leading for tea and for coffee and so on, that is sacred. Those are God-ordained appointments. So the other thing is, when do you take off your shoes? When do you do that? When you are home. That's when you take off your shoes. When you're home. <laughs> God is our home. He, he is our safe place. He is our place of surrender, of contentment, of satisfaction. We can take off our shoes. We can trust him. And we can be at peace. He is so good, isn't he? He's so good. And his calling on each one of our lives is to trust him and not be afraid. Trust him and obey. Trust him.